Seth, I know what information is in the general sense, but also in the computational sense with bits on, off kinds of things. But as a physicist, what, what do you need to know to understand the real essence of what information is? So information is physical. This was Rolf Landauer's slogan. Landauer was a physicist at IBM who worked on how information gets processed at the most microscopic scale. He worked on computation, but he also worked on heat flow, electrons moving from here to there. And Landauer's idea came from a very old idea in physics that dates to the 19th century. Um, there's a quantity in physics called entropy. And at the end of the 19th century, folks like Maxwell and Boltzmann and Gibbs were trying to figure out what the heck is this entropy stuff anyway. Now what is entropy in, in a generalized sense? It's the measure of order or disorder in the systems. Well, so, so entropy to begin with was just something that gummed up the works of heat <laughs> engines. Like, right, you know, right. it always increases, you can't get rid of it, and it prevents you from getting all the energy out of a steam engine that you'd like. Right. So Maxwell, Boltzmann, and Gibbs were asking, well, what is this entropy stuff at a microscopic level? And they realized it had something to do with the degree of disorder or randomness in the motion of atoms and molecules. So they're trying to characterize how much disorder there is, you know, when steam gushes out of a valve in a steam engine or when that wave back there crashes on the shore. And they realized if they could kind of count the number of states of these systems, number of possible configurations, and then look at how many bits it took to label them, that entropy was essentially proportional to this number of bits. Now, they didn't actually know about bits back then. Bits weren't coined uh, as a phrase, a binary digit or bit, until the 1920s by John Tukey. Um, but, but, but the quantity they came up with to measure entropy was actually number of bits to describe the atoms in the wave as the wave crashes on the shore. Um, so these guys, these physicists, were essentially discovering that entropy was information. So a fundamental physical quantity that governs how heat engines behave and how heat flows and how thermodynamics takes place was in fact at bottom information. Entropy is bits. And so what is the, what, what, what is the, the deep meaning of that? How, how do we then take it forward? Well, I don't know how much deep meaning it has. It's really just a fact. They like said, oh, hey, here's this quantity and this is entropy. But how well, people- Well, it does sound significant because if entropy, as we know, has some fundamental uh, 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 quality in the universe in terms of the early universe, low entropy and increasing, all these things, that if that is truly bits and information, that gives substance to the concept that information somehow is, is deeply entwined within the, the foundations of the world. Oh, well, is it's certainly fair? deeply twined within the foundations of the world. I just, you're asking me about deep meaning. I'm not a deep meaning kind of guy, you know. So, <laughs> so, but one of the first implications, the things that came out of this, if you like, this deep entwining of information and energy at the foundations of the world um, is quantum mechanics. So, um, when Maxwell and Boltzmann and Gibbs first defined entropy, they said, well, we got to count these numbers of configurations. And in classical mechanics, there's an infinite number of configurations. You know, particle could be here, here, or yeah. here. A continuum of infinite number of configurations, places could be along the line. So they said, well, that doesn't work. So let's like set a scale. Like we measure the particle to some scale here and we count those configurations, take the number of bits required to count those and that's the entropy. Um, but then trouble arose when people were looking at electromagnetic radiation and trying to count the number of configurations in electromagnetic radiation. It seemed like that number of configurations was still infinite, even if, like, you know, set some tiny scale. And in 1900, Max Planck proposed the notion that electromagnetic radiation was quantized. It came in chunks, which we now call photons. A photon is a quantized chunk of light. And if light came in chunks, then Planck was able to show that you could explain the amounts of radiation being emitted by hot bodies, so-called black bodies. And that at the same time, it also gave an absolute scale to the number of bits of information that were in any physical system. So if you combine this notion that entropy is information with the idea that things are quantized, everything comes in chunks, then all things have a finite, countable number of bits of information in them given by the laws of physics.
So you just need those two concepts, the concepts of entropy and the concept of quantum mechanics, of things being in, in, in packets or quanta. And, and then with those two things, you come to that conclusion. Yes, you get an absolute scale for the amount of information in something. So you and me, we have a few tens of Avogadro's numbers of bits of information charging around in our bodies. Avogadro's number being 10 to the 23rd. Yeah, yeah. 6 times 10 to the 23rd. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, large-scale physical right. systems have a lot a, of information. But it is a number that you can get to. Yeah. It's a finite number that you can describe with some numerals. Yeah, and, and actually if you look at tiny things like, say, an individual electron, an individual electron and if it's spin, it's like it'd be spinning like that or it could be spinning like that. It's one bit of information, you know, we call it spin up mm -hmm. zero, spin down one, one bit in the spin of an electron. So how important as a physicist working in the field is uh, understanding the nature of information in doing physics? It's brutally important to understand the nature of information to do physics. So um, these discoveries by Planck about entropy having a natural scale, you know, the amount of bits in a physical system being well, numbered exactly, this had huge implications for understanding the behavior of solid state systems, for understanding the behavior of light, and then for understanding the behavior of elementary particles, because quantum mechanics then allowed people to understand how elementary particles behave. There are only a certain number of species of elementary particles. They could only combine in a certain number of ways. And actually, you could only have a certain different number of types of atoms. The number of different types of atoms could only combine to perform chemical compounds, to form molecules in a particular way. So actually, quantum mechanics had a profound effect on our description of the microscopic world. The amount of information is quantized. It uh, can be quantified. And these bits of information can only take on certain forms. And that's why we have elementary particles, why we have atomic physics, nuclear physics, and why we have chemistry. It comes from this realization that information is key. Seth, I want to understand reality, and you tell me I have to know what information is to understand reality. Now, information, in the general sense, means things I know or things I should know. Uh, but information has a much more technical explanation. Tell me about it. Well, I'm not guaranteeing that merely by understanding information you'll understand reality, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, information has a, a, a technical sense which everybody's familiar with these days because we deal with computers and smartphones and cell phones and communication systems that break up information into bits. So the bit is the smallest chunk of information. It represents a distinction between two possibilities, you know, true or false, yes or no, here or there, or a little black pixel or a little white pixel on a black and white TV screen. Um, and so you can count the amount of information that you have in, for instance, what I'm uttering right now. I'm like creating in my voice, in addition to the words that I'm telling you, which are you know, a few bits per second or a few tens of bits per second, then my voice and its timbre and its change has a few thousand bits per second. And if you look at this beautiful scene here with the ocean there, the visual information has a few million bits per second. So we can count amount of information. Now, this is in some sense a new thing that we can count information. For thousands of years, information meant you know, knowledge, meaning, profound information about the nature of the universe, the origins of the universe, about religion. But the weird thing is that in some sense we've learned a lot more about information since we've been able to just count it and forget about the meaning. <laughs> so, you know, all right, maybe it means something, maybe it doesn't, but there are 70 bits. So like when the cable guy comes to your house in order to connect up your cable, his job is to make sure that you know you get a million bits per second coming into your TV and he doesn't care if you're going to use it to watch Shakespeare or porn. Yeah. So quantity of information turns out to be a very fundamental thing in the universe. And by understanding the quantity of information, you know, measuring how many bits of information are contained in an image, in a sound, in a word, we can learn a great deal about how the universe is put together. Now, it's certainly logical that you could have a great deal of information as you're defining it, and very little information in the common sense. You could have millions of, of, of pixels describing a, a random piece of art that has no meaning whatsoever, and then you can have a very few pixels showing a very rough image of your child. 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, in fact, one of the, the this astounding features of our world is that the number of bits is proliferating madly. Yeah, There's yeah. a promiscuous profusion of bits in the world. I mean, just think of the, used to be the blogosphere, just think of the tweetosphere, yeah. you know, all those tweets going out there, you know, gajillions of bits of information. And yet, how much meaning is there? Well, I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so how then does information in the technical sense kind of bridge that gap? How does that help us get to what we call real meaning as opposed to amount of, uh, of technical uh, bits that, that would describe that meaning? Well, of course, this is a very profound question that philosophers have been trying to answer for thousands of That's years. Why I'm coming to you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, <clears throat> they've had limited success and I'm not going to do much better. But um, a good way to think of how information acquires meaning is to think of what information does. So, uh, in uh, his philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein has this great example of a carpenter. And the carpenter is an assistant, and when the carpenter says hammer to the assistant, the assistant passes her a hammer. Right? When the carpenter says slab, the assistant passes her a slab. When the carpenter says you know, brick, the assistant passes her a brick. And from the assistant's actions, we infer that the assistant knows what the carpenter means. When she says, hammer, the assistant knows that the carpenter means, hand me a hammer. And so she hands her a hammer. There's a situation where Wittgenstein is trying to tease out the meaning of meaning. Um, and by just looking at how information makes people respond, what information does. So if we look not just how much information there is, but what information does, then we can learn a lot more about how meaning comes into existence. And the reason you can say hammer and not pass me the hammer is because there's prior knowledge that that information relates to in the brain in some way. So there's an interrelationship between different kinds of information. Right, exactly. So the, the assistant has expectations. So like, you know, if the carpenter said, said to me hammer, I'd say, huh? Hammer? <laughs> what? You know? <laughs> so. So there's a context for the information, and the information has a meaning within that context. And the way we understand that nowadays, I mean, is in fact about in terms of computation. So a good way of understanding meaning is to look at these actual physical digital bits that we collect on camera, that we go into our cell phones, and that get processed by our computers. So um, a way in which we can understand, you know, what information means in a particular context is, for instance, in a computation, you know, this bit here means do this. Like, so, you know, zero means, you know, add two plus two, and one means do that. So it means, you know, add three plus one. So zero instructs the computer to do one thing, and one instructs the computer to do another. And this is a context in which we know exactly what the meaning, if you like, of the information is. To the computer, zero means add two plus two. But what you need is not just that one bit, you need it to relate to what is in the computer prior. In other words, the, the information is only meaningful in that one or two bits because of what, how it relates to what's there before. Right, so the bit is a, an instruction and the computer has lots of bits in it already that allow it to figure out what it's doing. Um, I had, it was, when I was in college, I programmed a computer where to get it to operate, it had, it had started with a blank slate. Okay, and you had to like take these keys on the front of the computer and key in about 20 16-bit words, and then that instructed the computer to read a paper tape, and then you feed in the paper tape, which has these little holes, to you know, holes for one, no hole for zero, and then the paper tape reads in, and in 120 words, you could now read the teletype machine, and then you could type in the teletype machine, and then like put in some language. So, I didn't yeah. know you were that old. <laughs> <laughs> it was an old computer at the time. <laughs> So, so what, what, what is the significance of, of understanding information in this new technical sense, uh, not new, but it's, it's, uh, it's so much a part of modern life, in, in, in going beyond the technologies of, uh, of our gadgets today, but to really understand the nature of, of things? So at a physical level, information is everywhere. So if anything that can be in one of two different states can store a bit, then you know, any atom, any molecule can has, have a bit of information. So in that crashing surf out there, every molecule of water by its configuration, by its rotation, by its position relative to the other water molecules, it carries with it bits of information. Say a few thousand bits of information required to describe its orientation and how it's moving. 
And then whenever any two water molecules collide, they change and process that bit of information. So one way to think of two water molecules in the surf colliding is, ah, it's just a bunch of water molecules colliding, okay? But another is that what this water molecule does is a function of the information that this water molecule contains. So if it strikes it in this way, this water molecule goes off in some way like that, whereas if it strikes it in this way, it goes off like that. So you can think of this water molecule as essentially instructing this other water molecule what to do. But is this metaphor or is this reality when you're talking about information? Or is it just particles and molecules affecting each other in, in different ways, electromagnetism being the main one, gravity at times, etc.? The original way to describe the universe is that it's made of energy. E equals mc squared. Every elementary particle, every electromagnetic field contains energy. And we describe it physically in terms of the dynamics of how it changes over time. But merely by existing, these elementary particles and fields also contain information. You know, they're made of energy, but information tells us the form that this energy takes. So the fact that this chunk of energy is an electron, and this other chunk of energy is a photon, a particle of light, that's information. It tells you the form that the energy takes. So the universe at bottom consists not merely of energy, but of information. Merely by existing, everything contains information. And whenever something changes, so electron absorbs a photon, that information is processed. Bits flip. Now, bits flipping is a computation. So just as it's real to say that the universe is made out of electrons and electromagnetic fields and photons and elementary particles, the universe is also really made out of information and the way the universe changes over time is really a computation.